Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm really delighted to have everybody here to welcome Emily Isabel Marshall. Emily Isabel Marshall is a poet um, and she's written this wonderful collection of poetry called Bath of Herbs, which we've all read for today. She's also an academic, she's a reader at Leeds Beckett University in African and Caribbean literatures, theories and cultures. Uh, and we are so happy to have her here to read from her poetry and to discuss her work and she's willing to answer questions from you afterwards as well. Um, on the module, we've looked at lots of poetry, novels, films and short stories from the Windrush moment to the present day. Um, but that literature tends to be very London centric. So it's always welcome when we can find literature that talks about other experiences of being black in Britain or being mixed race in Britain. Um, and this collection talks about Wales, which is very um, Kind of personal and interesting to me because I grew up in Wales as well and had some of these experiences <laughs> that I can think of you know, see in this text the putrefying sheep yes, in the fields yeah. for instance yeah, <laughs> sheep poo yeah. ever, ever present sheep yeah, poo yeah and cow yeah. poo cow yeah. cats everywhere <laughs> <laughs> and also Yorkshire and France and of course um, the Caribbean as well is represented here in this poetry so please join me in welcoming Emily Isabel Marshall. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And it's a real pleasure to be here today. So um, for the next hour, I'm going to talk to you about my work and also about my life. But I want this to be a very informal session. You know, if you do feel you have a burning question as, as I'm talking, then, uh, then please raise your hand. But then after this bit of reading and sharing, we'll have um, a Q&A. And, uh, and we can have a chat because you know, I'd also like to know more about what you're studying on this fantastic um, uh, Writing Black Britain course and also I've spoken to a few of you who are MA and PhD students who are really doing exciting stuff. So um, what I wanted to, to do is to kind of take you on a bit of a journey um, and that journey will be framed by Bath of Herbs but I'm also going to share some new poems with you so these are poems that I've written since Bath of Herbs, but also speak to some of the topics um, that I cover in the collection. And uh, I've just been, Jenny's just presented me with this, these categories from, my, from the, the, uh, the poetry book, which I just love because I think when you're writing, you know, those of you that are writers, you don't, you don't sometimes, you're not able to take a step back and really see you know, where, you know, where are your key concerns. And so it's, it's, really, it's really exciting to be able to see this. Um, and I'm going to use it in the future. So thank you for that, Jenny. So the first part of uh, the story that I want to tell um, starts with my grandfather. And my grandfather would be very proud about this because he was a very proud man. Um, and, uh, and he loved nothing more than people talking about how great he was. So happy if you're there. <laughs> I'm doing just that. So this is Joseph Sobel, my grandfather. And, um, and Joseph grew up in Martinique. Now, as you'll know, Martinique is a small island in the Caribbean, uh, and it's a French-speaking island. Mm -hmm. I've just come back from Martinique. I hadn't been back for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Martinique is still a department of France. So in many ways, it still operates as a colony. It's a part of the EU. There's, uh, you know, the Euro. Um, you go into the supermarkets and it's all baguettes and, and brie. So, uh, so it's very much held on to its sort of colonial, well, France has held on to it as a, as a colony. Now, when Joseph grew up in Martinique, he grew up in a cane cutter's village. And all the children and adults, all the black children and adults in the village, cut cane in the cane fields, which was absolutely back-breaking work. He was brought up by his grandmother. He was brought up by his grandmother because his mother was a wet nurse for a white family. So she wasn't able to rear him. Now, he gained an education because his grandmother refused to let him into the cane fields to cut cane. And she really felt that education was the key and education was a way out of, this, uh, of, of, the, of the fate of the cane cutter. So she went out into the fields to cut cane so that she could save enough money for him to go to school, which he did. And he went on to university and then he moved to France in 1946 and actually started a really wonderfully glittering career as a writer. He became very well known and his first book is called Black Shack Alley. 
Black Shack Alley. It's a French book. Uh, it's La Rue Casnay. La Rue Casnay in French. But Black Shack Alley. And in that book, he tells the story of young José. And José is Joseph. So it's, it's semi-autobiographical. So it's pretty autobiographical, knowing his life. Um, it's a beautiful book. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that. But it's just become a Penguin classic as well. So it's a, it much easier to, to buy now. So uh, Black Shack Ali is, a, is now a Penguin classic. Another thing that Joseph would be unbelievably proud of. And, um, and Black Shack Ali was made into a film in the 80s, published in the 1950s, made into a film in the 80s um, called Black Shack Ali, or actually it's called Sugar Cane Ali, because in the States they, didn't, they thought the word black was too um, rebellious. So they used Sugar Cane Ali. So, so Sugar Cane Ali is the film of the book, and then um, this is the French version, La Rue Casnègre. So you can see here, you know, on the film poster, as the young José and the cane cutters um, in the cane fields of Martinique. Uh, so Joseph really drew from his life to be able to tell the story. And he ends the book by saying, and it is those who close their eyes um, and to those who close their ears to my story that I want to shout it out. So like many post-colonial texts, it ends with that, um, with that sort of uh, a plea to the reader, you know, to carry the story forward um, and, to, and to make use of it. So Joseph was a big influence in my life. He lived in France. He left Martinique and then he actually went to live in, in Senegal and then in France. He didn't go back to, uh, to live in Martinique. And he wrote several novels and poems um, and he was a bit of a Renaissance man, so he did, you know, these terrible iron sculptures and all sorts of things. Sorry, Pappy. But he, <laughs> he turned his hand to everything. Um, but he was a real influence in me and in my writing and in, you know, in, and in wanting to sort of to share the, the story of my ancestry and the story of, of me now. But also in a way that I hope really allows space for readers to connect with the work and find themselves within the work as well. Um, so this is, uh, this is Papi, my grandfather, this is his wife, Eni. And, um, and Eni, Eni it was a, a Martinican woman. She wasn't an intellectual like my grandfather. And it, uh, in many ways, towards the end of their lives, he wasn't very kind to her because of this. Now, Eni was much lighter skinned than Joseph. And Joseph was actually in the firing line with a lot of, inter a lot of racism in Martinique. Um, because of pigmentocracy. So people would say about Joseph, you know, you're too dark, you look too African. And actually when I was born, my Martinican grandmother said I had poor sauvé, which is saved skin. Because although my mother's dark skin, I came out very light. And it, that in Martinique was still uh, a sign of, you know, being able to sort of transcend poverty and move on to better things. So poor sauvé. So you can, you can see them here and my grandmother holding me back because I was really wriggly and always very physical <laughs> and wanting to break free. So I think that's a, a great photo. Um, and then this is a photo of my grandmother when she was younger in France with three children. They just emigrated from Martinique to France. And, and this is uh, Jenny, my mother, and my two uncles. So the first poem that I want to read is the title poem of the collection, and it's Bath of Herbs. And the book is really a book which honours the small and often unacknowledged acts of love between women, and women do down the generations, so for the mother's act towards the child, or grandmother towards child or mother. And so I really wanted to celebrate those often unacknowledged acts, and I think that this is what Bath of Herbs um, is really about. So this was a bath that my grandmother gave my mother just after she'd given birth to me. And um, in, in the Caribbean, they often you give these you know, beautiful healing baths. And you um, often, if you're, if you're in the Caribbean, if you're in Jamaica, Trinidad or Martinique, if you've got a little ailment, people will say, just wait there, just going to go into my garden, you know, and they'll find just the right herb, just the right plant for that particular ailment. And it's still the same today. Bath of herbs. Grandmother, healer, I give thanks. For while I mewed newborn in my basket, 
she laid birth ruptured, so you prepared a bath of herbs, gathered in your garden under beating summer skies. With pestle and mortar, you crushed calming yellow chamomile into young mint, pressed buds of newly flowered lavender, sprinkled ocean salt with rubbing fingers, mixed Caribbean cloves in oil of orange, made back then for now. Gently you mix, scrape, paste, add plant to water, spoon, test, swirl, until bath and steam are essence bursting and all is ready to receive. And so you lead her, coiled and naked, hurting tender, and slowly sink her into hot forgetting waters, unfurl her long aching body enveloped in steam. And your love hits her lungs into every crevice of her form diffuses, skin and soul now blessed, baptised, mother released, renewed. She will step out strong again to greet the world and me as I sleep deeply in my basket. Grandmother, daughter, healer, I give thanks. Um, so that was to my grandmother, Emmy. And I think that one of the other things I wanted to try and do um, here with a couple of the poems is to sort of reclaim um, my grandmother's voice. Because as I told you, my grandfather was a bit of an, a real intellectual. And, and in some ways, she wasn't listened to or she didn't really have as much of a platform. She was overshadowed by him. So there's poems in here where I, I try and reconnect with her history and try and listen to her voice. Uh, this, this next poem um, is to my great-grandmother, Montine. And this is Montine here. Now, you wouldn't mess with Montine, I don't think. Montine, um, would go, Montine is the woman who, who went out and cut cane so that my grandfather didn't have to. Montine was a, a, a really stoic an incredible woman, um, but who died early. Uh, she died, she died um, from overwork and exhaustion uh, from cane cutting. So this, uh, this is to Montine, so my great-great-grandmother, who refused to let my grandfather, Joseph Zobel, cut cane in the cane fields. Now what I've done here is a, bit of an, is a bit of an experiment really, is that I've taken passages from Joseph Sobel's book from Black Shack Alley and I've interdispersed them with my own narrative because I wanted to have the kind of, you know, I want to have like the stories layered one on top of the other. So the part, parts in, in italics are the parts from Black Shack Alley and, um, and it's from the end of Black Shack Alley when uh, Montine is, is, is actually has died and he's looking at her hands. And in those hands, he sees everything. He sees the love and the care that she gave him. And she, he also sees the lacerations from the, the many years of cutting cane and so, so all the pain and injustice of her life as well. Don't let the boy cut cane. Don't let the boy cut cane. Let him stand in a white uniform starched overnight in zinc buckets. Don't let his hands be split by the cutlass and furrow and crack like dark cane field earth baked by beating suns. Let his fingers be oiled and smell sweet, but not of sugar, not burnt in the boiling house. Let them poise pen over paper, wear fine gloves in white French winters sharpen red pencils, swing strong leather satchels while I force my slow rolling hips into the field for the cane must be cut. You let us take root, Montine, in the wreckage of your body and reach up towards the light. Montine's hands were black, swollen, hardened, cracked at every joint and every crack encrusted with a sort of indelible mud. Let us read the pages of your story as we trace your wounds in the lines of our palms. 
her scratched hands every day clinging to the handle of the hoe, an easy prey to the fierce cuts inflicted by the cane leaves. Let me hear the slash of your cutlass, Martine, as I tend to my Yorkshire dahlias wearing pink gardening gloves. See her hands, as if thrown there with sacrilegious carelessness on the whiteness of that sheet in the depths of that obscure shack. And what I also, you know, wanted to, to, to sort of think about as well, you know, with that poem, something I want to, to write about a little more as well, is that, you know, often at the centre of the story is the sacrifice of a black woman. And, and that can go, that can be sort of celebrated in a way, you know, that overlooks the fact that that sacrifice is forced upon her. So I wanted to, to, to write to that. And I also wanted to write to my, my own middle class, you know, and privileged life. And actually that her sacrifices meant that the whole of the rest of the lineage of the family were able to live completely different lives had she not made that sacrifice. Um, so those are, you know, those are the kind of the different, uh, you know, gendered and, 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 and class issues that I want to try and unpick in my work. Okay, so, so thinking about the archive and thinking about families, this overwhelming, gosh, I, when I look at it, it's, it overwhelms me. Now, this, now this, is the, this is my mum's archive. Um, and my mother passed away, uh, uh, sadly, of uh, pancreatic cancer in 2019. Um, and so she and she was a, a DJ for the BBC World Service. So she had lots of African and Caribbean records. She also had an incredible library. She also had all my grandfather's archive, pretty much, apart from the stuff that went to Martinique. So lots of photos, lots of albums, lots of letters. Um, and I stored a lot of these in a garage right next to her house. And I, I you know, put them all in boxes and labelled them. And I went to visit this garage um, about a year ago, and I, I, it's quite hard, you know, going, I'm sure some of you who may have had to deal with a, a relative that's passed, you know, to, to ride for three, to know what to keep and know what to throw away. So going to the, to, I didn't go and visit this garage that often, but I knew her stuff was safe there. But I went there, and there had been a leak in the roof, and everything was wet, and it was awful. So there was this sort of great big, you know, mildewing um, stacks of books and letters that were all stuck together, photographs that were stuck together. So I went to the, um, I went to the British Archives um, information page and found out about how I could save the archive, like what could I do? So this here is all of that brought home and like spread across the bed in a way which, you know, the British Archives would never suggest you do. Because <laughs> so I basically looked at the website and it was like, that sounds really complicated. <laughs> I'm just going to lay them out and hope for the best. And I did, and actually you know, I saved most of it. So this, uh, this next poem is, um, is about saving the archive. Um, but it's also about these two incredible photographs that I found, and this will speak to Jenny's uh, research on breastfeeding, is that while I was trying to go through this archive and find it, you know, all the sort of significant things, um, I found these beautiful photos of my grandmother feeding my mother, breastfeeding my mother in Martinique. And I just love this photo because at that time, you know, it, Oh, first of all, having your having yourself photographed may be you know, a lot of people quite stern, aren't they? In this, mm -hmm. and um, so you may not have felt that at ease with a photographer as we are now. Um, and not only that, you know, to be revealed in this way, to be breastfeeding, and to feel so comfortable having her photograph taken. So I don't know if it was taken by my grandfather. Who, I don't know who the photographer was, but maybe it was because she feels so. She feels at, at, just at one in a moment, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. I love this little chicken in the background and I, and I like the way that my mum is kind of looking up at her in this adoring way and then I found a photograph of my mum breastfeeding me um, with my little hat on so my little white head <laughs> to protect it from the sun so that so this so I wrote a poem about that 
called Mending the Ark, and it's on page 29. Mending the Ark. I have let this ark sink, and little has been spared. From the garage, I drag damp books, letters, photos, find creeping seas of mildew spread through clinging pages. Delicate clusters of mould bloom in the dark, billowing from the swelling sides of boxes, spewing fretful spores as the rain drips steadily through the leaking roof over the archive of your life. I salvage frantically. Back home, I unfold our history on my bed, let it dry out. Two pictures pull me. One small, faded, black and white. Mammy breastfeeding you on a wicker chair in her yard in Martinique. She holds your tiny, plump hand. Behind her, a contented chicken pecks. She is at ease with this photographer and awash with pride. You have released her nipple and your face beams up at her. Then one of you, 70s sepia, with a carefully sculpted fro, your white surprise baby at your breast. A carefully knotted handkerchief covers the delicate dome of my head. Your eyes, half closed, suspended between ecstasy and new mum exhaustion, smiling into sunlight, as if life will only offer more of this. Noah saved pairs, and so have I. Two mothers, two babies, a chain of nourishment. Grandmother and mother reach towards me. They tell me I can mend the up. Now, um, on the theme of archives, I thought I'd read you a new poem, a slightly longer poem, but I think you'll appreciate it. So this is um, a poem which thinks about ancestors and how if you have ancestors that were enslaved, that had to take, that were carried across um, Middle Passage, how there is a, a rupture in your history. Um, there's a there's a disconnect and so much of that history lies beneath the water and obviously as you know I'm not the first person to say this you know many post-colonial writers and critics draw attention to the idea you know that our history lies beneath the water so in particular Derek Walcott and people like Grace Nichols so that the act of excavating that history is also an act of you know looking beneath the sea looking beneath the ocean so many thousands of enslaved people died during Middle Passage, you know, either thrown overboard um, or committed suicide in the waves. So, so that, so that part, a whole part of that history lies beneath the ocean. And so this poem is about the kind of the, the difficulty of reclaiming that history, but also the frustration of, you know, wanting to speak to people or to to connect with your past. When you go to, so for example, I went to Martinique and to the plantation where my grandfather was brought up, but then also where many of my ancestors will have cut cane as enslaved people. And there's no, there's no, there's no tombstones, there's no registering of their names, you know, their names will have been um, changed anyway to French planters' names. So there's no documentation. So this is about the frustration of of trying to claim or find a way to tell the story, uh, to tell your ancestral story. Song of the Archives. So this is not in um, Bath of Herbs, this is a new one. So a hot off the press. <laughs> Song of the Archives. Walcott and Nichols tell us our archive, our graveyard, lies beneath the water. So between me and your history is middle passage barrier, song muting, fact crushing, soul graveyard, preventing the birth of your stories, salt dissolving umbilical continental cords beneath the water. No maps trace your journey. I cannot peer into the retina of your consciousness, 
Your eye sockets hollowed seep silence beneath the water. Beneath the water verses hide like hermit crabs. Words disappear inside their shells every time I move towards them. I long to throw you a life ring, pull you towards me, to be your lighthouse, your guide, your rope onto dry shores. I yearn to excavate your bones from among the fishes, from the suck of turbulent tides, from the knots of kelp forests, to put my shell ear to your skin stripped jaw and feel the roar of deep history written on your long forgotten tongue. It cannot be done. Perhaps if Br'er imagination and Br'er patience help me keep my head bent day long in the archive, reading and retracing threads with my pencil, with my keypad, drawing your stories out of water. Resurfaced, your sonic lung song could push out through your dry throat, sing across oceans, syllables darting like fish, touching the glittering surface of every continent, gliding up onto beaches, swaying across coconut trees or towering Victorian hotels, paragraphs blazing through neon resorts. Your history revealing itself, shaking itself, declaring itself for the first time. And while you will never breathe again, your children find new spaces in their lungs, now filled with the breath to sing your new old song. Ears will ring with it, archives shake with it, universities tremor with it, as we bellow it, this story of your lives before the water. So that's, that's, that's one that I wrote a couple of weeks ago after going to Martinique and sort of being um, inspired by that trip. And it's also, you know, proper academics poems. It's like the <laughs> archival research. <laughs> that's where it's at. Um, now, um, you will have noticed from reading Bath of Herbs that a lot of the poems are about my mother and overcoming death um, and death more generally. So the first part of the collection, Mother's Son, deals with that and deals with you know, coming, coming through the sort of trauma of, of losing a, a parent, especially one that you're very close to. So this is my mum and uh, this is, we're in Carnival. Now every year we play Leeds West Indian Carnival. We have a troupe called Mama Dreads Masqueraders and we always have a political theme to our troupe. So um, this one was actually remembering um, one of our one of the, the members that had passed. So it's a quite a lot of remembrance that happens. And, and so we have a, we are hibiscus flowers because hibiscus is a, a, a flower of, of, of remembering and commemoration. Um, so one of the other obsessions I have other than writing poetry is carnival and also trickster figures. So these kind of come into my work as well. So I thought it was fitting to have a, a, a photo of my mother, my son, and me at carnival in this sort of joyous space, but also I'll read a poem that speaks to that first section of the, of the book, which is, yeah, which is, which uh, deals with um, healing. So, um, oh yeah, one of the things that, you know, you'll probably ascertain as well um, from this poem is that while my mother was, um, while my mother was diagnosed uh, with pancreatic cancer, my daughter was also diagnosed with leukemia, so it's a very difficult time. She's fine, she's very well. And so my mother was able to come to the hospital room and support my daughter during that process. And so this poem also is, you know, talked about it's that, you know, often unacknowledged quiet acts of love. So this is, this is one of them. So it's on page 20, The Healing. In the corner of her hospital room, you sit like a prayer, half moon reading glasses at the end of your nose, novel in hand, steady against all proclamation of your five-year-old granddaughter's fate. 
who drape cheap market-bought kente throws over white metal bed frames, place bunches of bluebells in paper cups, which Doc will immediately discard a contamination risk. You burn incense, produce tubs of garlic-laden lentil soup, her favourite, as doctors hang chemotherapy charts, plug machines, plunge needles and discuss the myriad side effects. When we bring her home, long hair falling out in clumps, thick enough to plug the bath, you bring your quiet smile, your lavender rille de massage, your strong brown hands and pummel the toxins out of her, stretching her thin white blue veined body, rolling your fists, smoothing your palms over moonish skin, pushing your healing through fingertips deep into her treacherous blood. And that was my, so my, my mum was a great uh, masseuse and she often, you know, as well as like the bath of herbs, you know, as a way of connecting um, through, the, through the body. Now in a slightly more uplifting <laughs> vein, I'm going to share an, a new, another new poem with you. And, um, and this one is, a, is a, a, a carnival celebration poem really. Um, and it's sort of, again, is linked to my obsession with carnival. So as part of my obsession with carnival, which is a, it's a, it's a really you know, good gig, basically, you know, as an academic, I get to go to carnivals <laughs> so, um, and as research. So one of the, um, one of the events I went to was Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And there's two Mardi Gras in New Orleans. There's a sort of official Mardi Gras, which is a very much like sort of the rich, the rich, rich white men mainly, you know, on floats throwing beads to people who are all sort of you know trying to catch this plastic. Um, and then there's the Mardi Gras traditions in the black neighbourhoods of New Orleans, and and these are very African rooted, um, but they're very much sidelined. There's no funding, and they have this, this the costume making hat goes on for months. It's beautiful. So, um, so Mardi Gras is a is a you know form of celebration of Black culture, and um, and one of the places that everybody congregate con congregates during Black Mardi Gras. They actually call it Black Mardi Gras. It happens at the same time. It's a very segregated space, New Orleans. It the the for Black Mardi Gras congregate under the freeway. The freeway is a huge road that takes people from the rich suburbs outside New Orleans straight to the centre. And when they built this freeway, they do this a lot in American cities, when they built this free freeway, all the black businesses that were used to having passing trade just get completely overlooked. So the economy, you know, that were depended on that um, falls away. And, um, and so, so you don't have to deal with that neighbourhood, the freeway takes you over it. So it's interesting symbolically that the Black Mardi Gras happens, uh, is the congregation is under the freeway. So I, I, I really saw that as a kind of reclaiming of space. So this poem is inspired by this amazing woman who's 76. And another thing you notice in carnival traditions, it doesn't really matter how old you are, you could be 76, you could be 82, and you're still there dancing, you know, in a little skirt and whatever it is you want to wear or whatever your costume is, you show your body, you represent, you show up, you're there on the street, you're proud of who you are. You know, that is part of what carnival is about. So this is about Miss Delphine, who's 76. Mardi Gras under the freeway. Miss Delphine steps out the door. She pauses. The sunlight skids from the sidewalk, rests on her bright orange hand-stitched Ankara dress, scatters across the wooden slats to hit her beaded shoes, creating constellations. Today, her ancestors will be proud. On the steps of her porch, she feels the drum roll tremble, the street shake of processions drowning out the traffic drone. The spirit grips her, arches her back like that morning sunbeam cornering the door frame, kicks her feet high above her knees and now she's spinning across hurricane split paving, is dancing the dance of a black skin, warm thin, now rising and shining in the blare of brass and thumping drums. She walks towards the underpass, 
onto the segregated, uh, the segregating highway. A trombone wail turns her liquid. She hip rolls, her 70 year old body tricking time as it follows the pitching rhythm of the band. From this corner of the city, she joins the call, rising for freedom from under the freeway with a fierceness so bright that when Miss Delphine walks home that night, she knows the stars cannot shine brighter than her people or the shimmer of her dancing shoes. And that's props to Miss Delphine. <laughs> um, right. Okay, so the, the um, yeah, well, got a quarter of an hour, so I'm just going to um, I'm just telling you a little bit about um, my childhood in North Wales because I know that there's um, been a quite interesting focus on the North. You know, and we were talking, saying with Jenny that there tends to be kind of quite a lot London centric uh, voice um, in Black British poetry and writing, and and less so about the North. So I always felt a very strong connection to the North, to Yorkshire, because I also came from North Wales, and I think that there's that link of you know just feeling that we're often marginalised communities um, away from you know, the centres of wealth and power and that strong northern identity also I think connects me up with my Caribbean identity. So I, I lived in a commune for a while and then my parents got sick of communal living and moved to North Wales, uh, the middle of nowhere, it was a kilometre walk to the house so you know it was hard work but I, they wanted this sort of slightly hippie, rural, little. We didn't have a telly. I never know any references to the 80s, which are, you know, <laughs> part of popular culture. I'm terrible at pub quizzes. <laughs> but we did have this, this wonderful house um, that we rented um, in the middle of a field. And I went to a tiny Welsh school. This is our entire school here. <laughs> the dinner lady went on strike one right, for a month and so we all went to each other's houses for dinner so that's what, for lunch so that's what we're doing there so we're all so this is me like you know very like odd looking child with my dad used to brush my fro out and put a party in it like Dennis the Menace at a wedding <laughs> <laughs> and um and so this is our school and so my mother was one of the the few black women for for she used to say for a 50 mile radius um, and you know, people used to call her Jenny Deer, which means Black Jenny. There was a Jenny Wynn in the village, which means white, and they'd call her Black Jenny. And I always I said, Mum, you know, how does that make you feel? She said, oh, you know, you know, whatever. She often kind of let these things pass. But one, what was interesting was that in North Wales, because of this real celebration of Welsh culture and language, they felt a real affinity with my mum coming from the Caribbean and as a black woman. So she was really accepted into the community. She learned Welsh. My father is an English, you know, quite well spoken. That's where I got that voice from. My dad's side from Bognor Regis, the exotic climbs of Bognor Regis. <laughs> he, um, he, never, he was never really allowed in, uh, even though he learned Welsh, because, you know, he was, he's very much represented sort of, you know, Saxon oppressors. Um, so I find there's a strong link as well between that Caribbean um, heritage and, and growing up in North Wales. So I wanted to read the poem uh, Mamuad, which was a poem about my mother. And it's on page, let me see, let me find it. Um, <laughs> Thank you, perfect. So on page 19. So these are, this is me with my dad. We were sort of very free. A lot of the villagers would swim naked in a river. You know, they're all proper hippies. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, um, and I used to love going down to this river by our house. It was freezing cold water and, and swimming there with my dad. Um, and my mum also used to swim. So I think, you know, I think also for a Caribbean woman to get in that cold water, I think she was always very proud of her. But this one is thinking about that connection to the Caribbean and, and to Wales. Mamluad. We hunt for pieces of broken china scattered among the stones of Avon Croiso, icy with summit snowmelt under a bruised and sunless April sky. You find thick pieces of plate, blue and white, 
swirling with the wings of courting birds. You sit on a riverbank trying to fit resisting shards back together in your open palms. You tell me you love this once colonised land, which, like yours, hold fast to its tongue like lichen on stone walls. Squint, you say, and see how these fronds of river fern could unfurl against skies of cobalt Caribbean blue. At night, you could hear cicadas chant in chorus with the bleat of sleepy mountain sheep. I know you feel the pull of it, Maman, your island, Ile aux Fleurs. Yet here you are on a cold river bank, wrapped up warm and wading in green wellies. You are knotted to this valley, this cum, flanked by mountains with bellies burst open, their quarried entrails scattered all the way to the grey sea. You are tied by bonds of kinship, by sugar, blood, survival and slate. So when you stand in the flow of Avon Cloisel, holding China fragments tight, you are not home, but you know the river sings with all the echoes of Mamluad. Um, the, and I was going, I wanted to, um, I'm not going to read this poem for my dad and he's going to get really upset about that because he's always like, there's so much of your mum in this collection, <laughs> where are all the poems about me? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you've read it, you'll know that that poem's about my dad. So, you know, he is very much represented there. But I want to read a new poem, um, which is uh, a poem to Mammy Water. Are you familiar with the... Mammy Water, Mammy Water, maybe no. Mammy Water is um, Mammy Water is a, an an African mermaid, so it's a myth. So um, you know the new Little Mermaid sort of plays into with a bit of the sort of Mammy Water myth. So um, I wanted to to think about the Black Mermaid figure, Mammy Water, and I love to, to do cold swimming. I like to. I'm sort of very physical. I need to. I'm really annoying if I don't go and do a run or a swim. My family are like, just go and then come back when you're less hyper. So, um, so I love to swim and I swim in the River Wharf, which is a local river where it near Leeds in Yorkshire. Uh, when I, for the place where I swim, I always imagine, you know, what if Mammy Water came up the river and, you know, maybe what, what would our interaction be? And, and I also thought about the mermaid, you know, and mermaids globally and how they've just been always framed by the male gaze and always framed you know in their sexuality um, and how exhausting it must be for them so this is an invitation to mammy water to relax in the river wharf mammy water come now blessed one follow me for they have sexed you written you walked you over glass shards stolen your feet carved your light, painted you, mind-shaken you and forced you to burn and blister for a man's undeserving lips. They say you are charmer of serpents, calming with water-cooled hands. They call you La Sirene, Yemaya, Santa Marta da Damirora, Oxum, siren signaler of silent death, middle passage guardian, womb space warden, healer of diasporic agony, man-strung, dragged to the surface of boiling seas, still dripping with deep story algae. Come now, Mammy Water, for you are tired. I am girl river swimmer, daughter of land at home in Yorkshire waters. You are safe in my long brown body slipstream. Come, many-faced African womanfish, push upriver from grey northern seas with my grating salmon energy, you'll find me. I'll show you where the otters play. You can stroke their shining, looping, muscled pelts. I'll adorn your riverbank bower with marsh marigolds, waxy silver lilies. My son will fish you minnow suckers crowned with cow parsley, come to rest in my pool. Not news of all, painting trapped, but lying on your back, 
River currents like a lover tickling your knotted spine, watching a mango ripe sun pour golden over the wharf. So I just hope one day I'll find her there. <laughs> so the last um, couple of poems that I wanted to read you um, were about being of mixed heritage. So I've got, there's, there's a few in here and there's a few in my hopefully forthcoming collection. Um, I will read um, the reason I slapped Barry because I've got a new, and I want to end on a new poem. So I'll read the reason I slapped Barry. Thank you. Thank you. Page um, seventy-eight. So, I have noticed after I read the, after I wrote this that I haven't been very good at changing the names of people <laughs> <laughs> who bullied me when I was a kid, <laughs> and I really was bullied because I didn't fit. You know, I was. Um, you know, I had a black mother, I was light-skinned, I had this big bushy hair, I was living in the sticks. Um, everything was not right, you know. I came to school in wellies, it was just, yeah. So, um, but th this, this, is, this is about feeling that the space in which I grew up in Wales was mine, and I claimed it, and I always feel at home there. It's my mamluad, my homeland. The reason I slapped Barry I wasn't sure I meant to mark your face, wobble your fleshy cheek and bring tears to your eyes. But that grey world of slate and dripping bracken, of cloisor and glistening sheep poo in the drizzle was also mine. Mine too, the pools of icy water, so clear the bottom looked like pebbles hung in glass. So when you dived in after class, your breath was punched right out of your body. Mine, the ocean-bound valley flanked by mountains, whose arms reach out to protect a cum, which gently flattens towards the sea. So that every primary school picture I ever drew was set in mountains, with a cheery sun and thick pencil-scribbled clouds. So when you call me half-caste, you cast me halfway out of my world, my homeland, my mamluad. And that slap was for halving me and proving that all of this was mine in full. No. And actually, this book is actually being sold in a local bookshop in North Wales. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> so, so we'll see if the, the message ever gets through. <laughs> Um, so finally, um, the two poems, let me see, so I've got this one, okay. Um, okay, I'm going to read you, I'm going to re finish by reading, um, I'm going to finish by reading two new poems. So these are my these are the academic books that I've written. So this is Anansi's journey, which looks at the the trickster figure, the Anansi stories, and traces their journey from uh, Ghana through to Jamaica. And um, so I did quite a bit of research and, and did quite a lot of field work in in Kingston for that one. Um, and then my second book is about the Brer Rabbit trickster figure in America. So looking at this very different cultural trajectory. What interests me is how we tell stories and oral folk tales and how also these can be used as resistance narratives. So there's quite a few poems in the book um, about Anansi, but I'm also, I think, interested in how in society, especially as women, we are supposed to behave and perform in a certain way. And what's wonderful about the trickster figure is that the trickster knows no boundaries and can often cross them, break down, there's a liminal figure, and there's a figure of the betwixt and between, and always has that rebellious energy. 
And it's that rebellious energy that I feel like I want to harness in my own life that I think can be inspirational for people, you know, especially for people in marginalised positions, you know, because of all sorts of uh, intersectional um, oppressions. So the, the, the trickster reclaims space for people. Or embodying some of those trickster qualities can help you reclaim space. So um, there's a Nancy silence uh, in the book, um, but I want to read you a new poem which is called Try to Map Me. And I don't know if you, oh, I know because it's black, it's black British, isn't it? A wonderful poet called Kai Miller, um, some of you may have come across. One of my favourite collections, A Cartographer Tries to Map a Way to Zion. And it's a really interesting conversation between a Rasta man and a cartographer, a map maker. So between the sort of colonial voice and a Rastafarian voice. And the whole book is this dialogue between these two persons. And they, it's, it's very, it's beautifully done. It's a lot to do with mapping and the type of power that we have when we map a country. So um, th I was teaching Kai Miller's collection and then I wrote my own poem um, inspired by that book, The Cartographer Tries to Map Away to Zion. So I thought as well about how you know, women's bodies are us, are mapped by the male gaze. You know, we always, and all, every, we're so scrutinised physically. Um, you know, every part of us. So it's about trying to resist that as well. Try to map me, she said. Try trace my contours with your pen. Draw my ridges, hidden coves. Commit to paper the features of my hills and valleys. But you will only find my outline. Your charts will not determine the storms that carve my bays the stillness of my caves. I shall write you then, he said, in sonnets and in prose, distill in verse, wrinkles between brows, the harmony of leg and arm and waist. Try to write me and you'll miss the beating of my temple, the smell I leave behind on my side of the bed, the shape the battered backs my old slippers take the sharpness of my early morning breath. Only burnt beneath your fingers will you feel the anger swelling in my belly in the days before I bleed, the answer to what makes me woman. My salty fissures and my cracks in words cannot be tracked, live uncharted, uncontained, beyond the world of facts, so this body will remain unmapped. Okay, you've been very attentive listeners. Looking forward to hearing your questions. Um, so the final poem I wanted to, oh, it's a bit, I don't want to end on a, it's a good poem, but it's a heavy poem. I don't know if I want to, if I, let me see. <laughs> okay, well, if I, I can, uh, okay, just give me a second. All right, okay, right. So I told you I went to Martinique um, a couple of weeks ago to do, I went to the carnival to do some carnival research and all my friends go, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did, didn't you? <laughs> but it was genuine carnival research. But what, what was great about going back to Martinique, um, so I hadn't been there for 25 years, was that I got to see um, a school that was dedicated to my grandfather, Joseph Sobel, and also um, at, in this school, there's a bronze bust of him. So this is, this is, this is my grandfather. And he, again, would have loved this. <laughs> All this fuss. <laughs> um, but on a more somber note, this, so, you know, it's a huge honour to sort of stand there and be at the school named after him. But it looks across at the plantation where he grew up. Uh, it looks across at the plantation where, you know, our ancestors will have been buried in unmarked graves. So that kind of, that, that juxtaposition was, was really moving, really got to me. Um, and I also, while I was there, I went to a, a, a plantation uh, where they make rum called the Clement Plantation. And there was an incredible exhibition of artists from Benin um, that, that, that responded to the history of the plantation. In fact, there was hardly anything about enslavement on that plantation. It was 
really erased apart from some of these pieces of art which didn't really have any you know any kind of um, signage or anything like that but one of the most remarkable pieces I thought was this just the words blood and then the great sugar cane and banana plantation in the background I thought it was really striking so this is a, a poem to Martinique to to that island um, and thinking about that juxtaposition also so beautiful there it's so beautiful you know it, it, it's easy to romanticize the Caribbean because we know of the history and we know that of po the poverty in the, on many of the Caribbean islands but the flowers and the light and so all of that exists you know simultaneously um, but it does it's, it's difficult not to get seduced by the beauty Martinique I hear lullabies in your name, notes singing between syllables, island of flowers, mother's birthplace. You roll across my tongue, sweet as the swaying of my grandmother's hips dancing labiguin. But under the sweetness, a whispering, like the slash of cane cutting cutlasses, wielded by ancestors, buried in unmarked graves in your rich red earth. So I stand, la tresse, edges of my skirt lifted by warm breezes, next to the bronze of my grandfather, honouring his world of words, looking across your southern undulations at the plantations of his childhood, sight of rupture and blood, cutting a trail back to Benin. All around me hummingbirds seek nectar from deep within the throats of sunshine-tipped heliconians, and pelicans dive for silver fish on the distant rolls of the ocean. And I wonder how your abundance, your loveliness, which nearly hurts the eye, has also seen us in chains, how you've spread the roots of oiseau de paradis over our rusted manacles. Are you beautiful, Martinique, to distract us from the blood dripping down the pages of our past, to allow our relatives hemorrhaging into your green flanks a moment to stop in between the cutting and trace the lines of the egret's flight across the blue and imagine freedom? Or is your mantle of seducing flowers a mocking? Do your cicadas laugh into the night because we struggle to remember so soothed are we by the sight of your softly swaying cane, as gentle as the sea that carried us to our endings. Martinique, I hear lullabies in your name, but I must not sleep. Okay, okay, my, I'll read my uh, last poem then. Um, so, okay, this is a little... Um, Oh, I should read from Bath of Herbs. I will read. Hey, I'll read one that I posted actually on Instagram today because it always makes me laugh. Um, and it's called uh, Cross Country is 79, What They Do in the Dunes. So I was a bit of a geek at school. I was really into my running. And um, I was fast when I did cross country. So I loved, I loved like being up ahead. But... Um, all, everyone else was always having more fun, like not engaging in cross country. <laughs> like secretly, I, I wish that wasn't like, the one who's like, yeah, you know, getting really into everything all the time. So, um, so this is to my to my former self. I still definitely still this person now though. Um, cross country, what they do in the dunes. My shadow follows me across the empty beach as I skirt the threshold between sand and ocean, discount trainers beating a lonely drum as the noon sun spreads itself across the sky. My classmates laugh and snog in white hot dunes, and I imagine the press of pink lips, the feel of teeth stroking tongue, untrained, searching between thighs. I dream the taste of handbag stolen menthols, illicit drags, cloud gazing in the marin grass. So, no sense of victory in my win against class seven. I ache only for what they do.
in the dunes. <laughs> so, um, so thank you for, for listening to my poems and, and a bit about my life. Um, and yet, yeah, I'd love to hear if you have any questions, um, any thoughts, any reflections, anything you from your own, the way it might resonate with things in your own life. Well, let's say thank you, first of all, for a wonderful reading. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> and then I'll just open up for questions for everyone. Feel free to just jump in with your questions. Can I ask um, about poets that have influenced you? You talk about Derek Walcott and um, yes. Grace Nichols. I wonder what other poets have been influenced you um, as a poet. Oh, well, I love I love um, Kamal Brathwaite, um, and um, and I've also really been inspired actually by a lot of more contemporary poets that are writing at the moment. So, in particular, I'm, I'm part of a readers and writers group with People Tree Press, and um, and we meet every month or every couple of months, and sometimes they don't always come along. But there's people like Malika Booker. Um, Khadija Ibrahim um, and Malaika also works closely with Roger Robinson. I don't know, you've, maybe you've read The Portable no, Paradise? Yet, no, yet, no, no. <laughs> on, on, not on the module? It's sometimes on the module. Yeah. I might read it at the end. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Portable Paradise by Roger Robinson is a fantastic collection. Um, so he's a black British writer. And have you have you come yeah. across him? No. And um, and I think what what Roger Robinson does is that he sort of really it, they're very they're very pensive you know and quite sometimes quite serious poems but he really writes from the heart so there's always like the sort of hook in there that's human and I think that that is really important to me that I I want to feel the, the kind of the human connection in the poem and Roger will take a, a very you know a very fleeting kind of moment and then find that human connection but then tether it to something much bigger so he writes poems about he's written a beautiful poem about Grenfell when he imagines some of the people who passed away in Grenfell um their spirits are rising up towards the clouds and it's, but it's so it's done in a way which is not you know it's not over sentimental at all it's beautiful um and he also r writes about Black Lives Matter um the Windrush scandal so these he's a bit like the sort of um, contemporary Linton Quasi Johnson, the contemporary version of it, where he distills a lot of black history into into the work contemporary politics, but in a way which which connects to the human. So he's a great, um, he is a, an inspiration to me, as is Kai Miller as well. Um, and and Malika Booker, again, another poet to, to look out for. Um, Malika uh, started what she called Malika's Kitchen, in um, in London in the 80s and 90s. Basically, she, they felt that there wasn't enough much of a platform for black British writers. So she said, well, look, why don't we just meet up in each other's kitchens or you can come round to my kitchen and we'll share poems. So it'll be one poem per person and you, you bring that poem, you read your poem and then if you've attended any classes or um, you've been to any readings or you've found out anything new about the craft of writing poetry, bring bring it to the space as well. And it went on for years, and it actually, from that Malika's Kitchen um, uh, uh, group, that all these sort of um, talents were, were were platformed and uh, and 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 kind of triumphed, and they made a space for themselves. And so Malika, there's a collection called Malika's <coughs> Kitchen now from some of those poets mm -hmm. that were nurtured. Um, so I I love Malika Booker's work as well. And I think, as, if any, are any creative writers among you? Yes, yeah, that's what I was. So, uh, uh, you know, and you probably, do, do you attend any writing groups? Yeah, we actually yeah. have a really good one at NTU called RAP. Mm -hmm. It's what NTU staff and students. Yes. And yeah. it's just a space where people can bring what they've written and work with RAP lead writers and ambassadors and yeah. get help and encourage, like, writing, reading and performance practice. That's brilliant. That's brilliant, and that's just open to everybody. At NTU, everybody we have who's a rap cafe, which is open mic night, and the local public can can. Yeah, that. is that once a month? Yeah, yeah. No, that's wonderful, and I think that that's it's that space, isn't it, that really helps you. And I th with Malika's Kitchen, the rule is that if if someone when you critique the poem, someone else's poem, it's the poem that's being critiqued, not the person. I think that's really. Yeah. 
um, you know, it's sometimes you have to remind yourself of that, don't you? Because you make yourself vulnerable when you bring a piece in. Yeah. But that's good to know, you know, we should do more of that at our university. Malika Bukak, she came to NTU. Oh, Florence did she? Symposium. Yeah, she's wonderful. Yeah. She did a workshop at Language Mastered last summer. Oh, did she? she's great, yeah. Yeah, yes. Oh, that's great. Well, she's a wonderful performer of her work as well, you know, and I think that's a, it's a whole other skill, you know, some people are wonderful on the page, but then when you see them, it doesn't sing in the way that it might have sung in your own mind. Um, yeah. Well, that's yeah. She's she's uh, she's a, she's a bit of a role model to me as well. So all of those yeah, all of those poets. And I think in terms of um, as writers, I love Toni Morrison's work. And I think that sometimes some of the things that I read in her work resonate with me in ways that I'm, it's probably quite unconscious, but I feel like I go to, into the sort of Toni Morrison world, you know, and with my work sometimes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about um, you. You were obviously you were quite like an active person, but not quite an active person, a very active person. Yes. Yeah. Um, and how how does that um, influence? It clearly does. How, how does it like uh, go into and come out of what you produce on the page and, and from your mouth? Yes. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And it's. Um, so I think you know I've always had. I don't. Are you are you a bit like that yourself? Yeah, because yeah, I saw you nodding when well, I said. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually around saying things to myself. Then that's how I start writing. Yes. Yeah. Well, I I I always find that um, writing. That, so running and walking, and also swimming, like help me with my writing, and that even the the rhythm of in the rhythm of with walking, the rhythm of your heartbeat, the rhythm of your step on the ground, um, can help the rhythm of the poem come. Mm. So I, I often walk and then I'll just do on voice notes. It makes me think that I'm like Alan Partridge, though, like an <laughs> idea for a programme. <laughs> but, but I often do voice notes for my, uh, for, and, and while I'm doing some of these activities. Not, I haven't quite got there with swimming yet, but I'm sure there's a way. Um, and so, the, the, and I also feel that, you know, there's this physical world that I, I want to swim in inhabit and and live within that that physical landscape but um but it's so beautifully paired with the world of words and uh, but actually that world of words has been very dominated by a particular type of voice in terms of our literary and poetic traditions so that by going into these you know going up mountains and being maybe a, one of the, you know one of the few women or a few brown women you know it, it's actually it's similar to, to writing about that experience as well because when you write about that experience you're writing into a nature writing tradition that is also very uh, you know dominated by particular forces yes yeah. but I, I have I've been I've been um, doing another side project recently with them um, black and brown hiking groups because uh, I'm training to become a mountain leader which means climbing a lot of mountains which I don't have always that much time for because I've got two kids but um but I've interviewed the leaders of um of black girls hike uh, black scottish adventurers peaks of colors so all these incredible groups that have uh, really often flourished after lockdown and the black lives matter movement but which are all about focus on that decolonizing of the countryside um, and uh, encouraging people who may not have had the access to go out into the mountains and into those spaces. That's been great because that also helps me then be at work, but be climbing a mountain interviewing someone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a trick to learn, aren't it? yeah, 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 exactly. Like think of the thing you really love and then try and work out how you can make that work. <laughs> yeah. But do you do that? Do you read? Do you write? And uh, do you make your sort of physical activity a part of your writing? I walk and write. Um, I try to do some voice notes, but it doesn't quite work. Yes. Um, or, or I get distracted, forget to do it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I usually end up from memory when I get back. Get or, back. Or stopping somewhere on the way with it. Yeah. Notes and just making notes as I go along. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the key thing, isn't it? It's that when you've had that seed mm. to get it down on paper. But another good thing is then um, uh, photographs. Yeah. <coughs> so we're working from the back. Yes, or, or yeah. Bits of form. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes I, you know, and I know in, you know social media is, is lots of problems with it. But sometimes even like if I 
document a walk and put some photos on on Instagram, then I've got the memories then to trigger the thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had one, just, mm-hmm. and you kind of answered it with some of the stuff that you were talking about, but I'm going to ask anyway. Like, motherhood, motherland, and mother nature are things that are really central to your, to your poems mm-hmm. and your collection. And it made me think, when reading this, about how these terms are often taught and understood in very Eurocentric ways, and how then they're quite emptied of meaning. Mm. So, was your engagement with these terms, because it felt very post-colonial, did mm. it influence your writing process? And was it a conscious effort to encourage a rethinking of these terms and themes. Mm. So as you said, motherhood, motherland and mother, mother nature. Yeah. I you know, I've not I've not consciously sort of linked those and I love the way that you've done that, you know, those three the three workings of mother there. But I do I always approach these 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 from a, a, a sort of you know post colonial deconstructive kind of angle, so um, I do think that I want to to challenge some of the kind of preconceived ideas of all of of nature of motherhood, um, and um, and you know one of the things that I especially in my next collection I want to is is not always to celebrate as well you know motherhood as as a joy you know to think of it as something which. You know, we we need to embrace as women, but I have poems in there about, um, for example, you know, a hedgehog just getting up and leaving her hoglets, which hedgehogs do when they are disturbed, you know. So it's called Left, and it's just about, and I've got a few poems there about, about mothers just going, you know, and just leaving, and just, but not being punished for it. Um, and and not, and not, not, they're not being a sort of re, re, horrible repercussion, but it, trying to tap into, for me as a mother, and having had a really close relationship with my mother, it is also at, you know, at the essence of my being, but I also um, feel that it's important not to perpetuate the myth of, of motherhood. Mm-hmm. Um, one of those myths is no one ever telling you how much it hurts when to give birth, you know? Other mothers don't, mothers don't tell mothers. <laughs> you know, otherwise we probably wouldn't do it. But, <laughs> so, um, and in terms of the idea of you know the the um, the, the motherland, um, I agree that in many ways you know we think of the mother the the motherland has been used in all sorts of ways as a kind of nationalist ideology you know which is really problematic, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like if we think of the mother India mm-hmm. um, uh, rhetoric, you know, and um, and it's often used by men as a way to promote nationalism. But for me, my connection with Mamluad in Wales um, was as, was not so much sort of wanting to position Wales as woman, but just as as a kind of you know as the giver of of life, um, like my connection with my own mother. In terms of the mother nature, I think that's something that I want to return to as well, and um, and I think. One of the things that we tend to, there's a very masculine attitude in walking and climbing in terms of claiming space. You know, it's quite colonial. Mm-hmm. So, like, how, you know, I, I, if you, if you speak to people who are walkers, hikers, they'll always say bagging peaks. How many peaks did you bag? It's called bagging. You know, <laughs> like bagging actually sounds like, you know, shagging, doesn't it? It's like, you know, bag to bag that. Yeah. So there's some something about claiming space, which is linked as well, I think, to you know, to claiming um, physical territory and also uh, um, you know, and in geographical space. Mm-hmm. So I think as a woman walker, there's a very different um, attitude to to that to that in relationship of move of going up a mountain of moving through nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ooh, yes, cool. yeah. <laughs> Lot more. I love the work of Nan Shepherd. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you've come across no, her. She's I'll... good for your female flaneur. Thank you. Yeah, she's yeah. A, a a very early explorer of the Cairngorms in Scotland, okay. and she writes um, Nan Shepherd. She's a she's a poet, um, and uh, and and a writer. Have you, have you come across her work? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was free and audible. But it was free on Audible. Oh, was it? Oh, was she free? Was it? Yeah, yeah. Actually, on Audible, really nicely read as well on Audible. But Nan Shepherd wrote about um, climbing the Cairngorms, which are some of the most um, fierce 
um, landscapes in Britain, you know, it's the sort of like Arctic winds, hurricanes, it's, it's really, really fierce. But she would go out there uh, with very basic kit and just, she never tells you which peak she climbed. She doesn't really tell you, um, you know, which, how many miles she did. She doesn't tell you what boots she took with her. She just tells you about this tiny little bit of lichen that she saw and all the worlds that, you know, were enveloped in this little bit of lichen. Or she'll describe sleeping on a ledge. She'd sleep out on a ledge in, on, in the Cairngorms, in the snow, with her, she's in, in the 1960s. Um, and, uh, and under the stars. And so she just describes that experience of like her relationship you know, as a woman to the nature in a way which is so refreshing when you read so many books about nature and hiking and you know written by men it's such a different attitude yeah so I definitely recommend her. Um, the way you write about health and illness really resonated with my own health journey mm. um, in mother son and blood pressure you're using pairs of lines with with these gaps mm. between could you tell me what what was your sort of thinking behind using that sort of structure was yeah. there something you were trying to put across yeah I, yes i think i think i have this you know in a few of my poems is that uh, i think that those pairings and it's you know I, I love hearing when people point these things out but um those pairings i think are to do with undercutting the voice of the medical profession, um, which I, I, and, and also all the, the procedural, um, that is so alienating. Um, and also my, I think for me, when I get all that, I spent you know, two and a half years doing my, my, with my daughter's treatment and then a long time, and it sounds like you've had similar experiences, long time through my mother's treatment, in hospitals and my gut instinct is just to get the hell out of mm -hmm. there you know <laughs> I just want to escape and I know that the NHS is amazing and I know that everything is for a really important reason but it's like this you know so um and there's something about the structure of of the of the of the you know the, of those procedures and the how this how sterile it is and how um and how we become you know how we, you know, we are not the people or anymore. It's the workings of, you know, the uh, the sort of biological workings that are focused on. So I am, um, I think that undercutting is about, you know, the response to the sort of authoritative medical um, profession, and then how I actually feel that mm -hmm. undercutting, you know, that need for escape or the need for a human touch, you know, like my mum coming into the. My, my daughter's treatment room and bringing flowers and then the flowers get thrown away and um, and and uh, and all the with the blood pressure one just like thinking just let me get out of this place <laughs> you know, I know I've got high blood pressure it might kill me but I'm gonna be worse off in here <laughs> and I get this white coat syndrome it's terrible there's the more stressed I get about it and they say, you've got to calm down. Calm down! It's like, <laughs> oh, I'm meant to calm down with this, you know, thing on my arm. So, uh, so uh, yeah, that's definitely... And I think throughout the collection, there is this, this juxtaposition of, you know, the official authoritative narrative and, and where I sit with that. So maybe imbuing some of the trickster that I'm obsessed with as well, uh, like in the vicar's letters, where the vicar is telling me to you know, get rid of all the trinkets on the grave. And I was saying, I wrote in my phone call with the vicar, I was like, for millennia, people have been honouring their dead, you know, with trinkets, with little bits and pieces and memorabilia. This is like, a, you know, a human urge. You have to recognise that. She's like, 30 centimetres, that's it. <laughs> Everything else will be discarded. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the um because you've done the wonderful folklore of Anansi and um and rare rare, rare, rare rabbits and rare, rare tales. Mm. So I wanted to ask you um because obviously it's a very good part of your life because you've done lots and lots of research around it. So I wanted to ask I suppose how that's influenced your poetry or just influenced your life, you know, mm -hmm. your, your love of folklore. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, oh, thank you. That's a lovely question. And um, and so I think um, I did a, uh, like a TEDx talk recently uh, about the trickster figure. And I was while I was preparing for that, is that made me really think about how that question, you know, of how it influenced my life. But those stories like Rare Rabbit, you know, and and and, and the Nancy stories, as as you'll know, were used as um, as a form, a coded form of resistance for enslaved people on the plantation. So the stories themselves outline actual um, uh, uh, practical ways of resisting uh, the plantation system. So they would be told as oral stories, but they were coded strategies of survival. And I argue that that um, that, that that those practical methods of resistance and that form of storytelling also psychologically allow people to rebel against the system, which then could form more outright rebellion and revolt. And that, um, but also those stories, they, they're not set in a, in a Christian framework of good and bad. So there's this sort of moral ambiguity to those stories because you as the listener are supposed to work out what is the right way to behave. You don't always act as the trickster does, but sometimes you might, depending on what your conditions are, what your situation is. So I think for me, the way that those stories influence uh, the work is that I'm always thinking of things from a sort of resistance narrative, um, but I'm I'm also I I sort of like to celebrate that the liminal space, the the in between, and and perhaps poke at the the moral or judgmental ideas about the right and wrong way to behave, the right and wrong way to do things. But the other thing is is in terms of storytelling. So I think that one of the ways to, to try and keep the memories of people alive, you know, like my mother and my grandfather, as I'm doing it here in Bath of Herbs, um, you know, is, is that it, it's the taking forth you know, of our history to the next generation. And it's so important. So I'd, I'd like to see myself as, you know, as part of that line of storytellers um, who's channeling that, you know, the, the storytelling energy of Anansi and, and Br'er Rabbit. Uh, what I also liked, uh, finally, is that Nancy and Brad Rabbit are both men, both male figures, and like, there's loads of stories about Nancy and his sexual prowess. Like, you know, he has this, um, as one story is one found in Ghana rather than Jamaica, his penis is 12 foot long mm -hmm. and he can break it off and then impregnate 12 women. So, so it's a lot to do with like Anansi's virility, you know, and and the Jamaican stories is is you know that celebration um, of masculinity and virility. So I like to think of like what does an, a female trickster look like? Um, what does a female Anansi look like? Like what are our you know what are our tricks? What are the things that we uh, celebrate? What is our you know what are our so-called conquests? So so I like um, I like to re try and reposition that into a more of a female gaze. <laughs> oh, you were, you were going yeah, to ask so a question, yeah. I'm um, kind of half covered it anyway, yeah. but um, I was reading Anansi's mother, um, Anansi Mothers, and yes. I was looking at um, the, the use of like, I guess textile imagery and those like links between women and the act of creation in creating oral storytelling tradition. So I was just wondering whether you could talk more about how oral storytelling helps remember women from the past rather than written. Yes, yeah. And, um, you know, that is, uh, it's great that you, you know, the way you pick up on that. And it's amazing when you start thinking of the links between um, spinning or textiles and storytelling. They're endless, aren't they, you know? in terms of the web and the thread and the spinning of stories and and um and all of those uh, kind of juxtapositions the weaving of the tale um and i even think you know with the uh the idea of the, of the web as well like the world wide web you know that no one says that anymore but still <laughs> um but in terms of the portals of storytelling you know again i think that it's that idea that um you know, no who will who will tell who will tell so for some women, you know, who's going to tell their story? Like my grandmother, who was so overshadowed by my grandfather in a sense that he was this famous writer and this big presence and, you know, and, and, and a, such an intellectual. But she, 
she grew up in Martinique, she had so many beautiful proverbs and stories of her own that she'd committed to memory that she would pass down to us. And so I think that it's, you know, our job, it's our job as, as sons and daughters to keep the stories of women who may have not been centre stage alive and tell those stories, to pass those stories down. I think that's the way of readdressing, you know, the skewed balance of history. And, and if you can't find yourself in the history books and you can't find yourself in print, at least you, know, but you can find yourself in those stories and no one can tr control those stories. Yeah. yeah. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. um, you speak about um, how you felt as being an outsider. And I was just thinking, was it just the, like the landscape that kind of made you feel like grounded mm -hmm. to where you're from? Or was it also other things as well? Um, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, I think as a, as a light skinned mixed per heritage person, you are always a little bit on the outside, on the peripheries, you know, and I think that's why that liminal space of the trickster fascinates me as well, because you, but what you, what you also end up doing as well is kind of breaking down monolithic ideas about race so if people say oh well, all black people are like this or all white people are like that you know well us mixed people you know in the middle we we could challenge those very any kind of monolithic ideas about race um and you find yourself you know slightly on the slightly on the outside of lots of different situations but i think it's a quite a it's a it's a it's a good place to rest in some ways because you can also see through things um, and maybe a more clear, in a more of a clear-eyed way, when you're slightly on the margins, mm. you know. So, and that's so I dress in that poem, um, mixed up, of you know, of people saying Notting Hill Carnival. You know, my friends saying, "Oh, we're the only white people here." I'm like, "Who, who are you calling white people?" Mm. You know. But then at the same time, um, you know, being in a in a group, you know, group of black girls, like, "Why do you, you know, are you half class? What are you like? Who are you? Who, who are you?" So definitely the landscape has helped me find, you know, a place that I, I am, um, you know, I feel at one and feel at home. But I think I also uh, embrace the, the liminality of the position as well. So to be on the borderlands in some respects, I try and see that not as a place where, you know, oh, you don't know if you're one thing or the other, or you're always a little bit left out. I try and think of it as a, a creative space where you can sort of challenge more um, static views about the world. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Does, yeah. Can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested in, in when you're putting a collection together, mm. um, the order of the poems, and and it's often reading. I mean, I've read it through once, mm -hmm. um, and there were there were poems that I could sort of see spoke to each other. And um, one of them was like Wild Camp and Snowed and Lily that actually had um, that halfway between earth and sky. Oh uh, yes, yeah, live, yeah. Uh, but but in other poems, I can really see how the poem sort of sp speaks yes. to a poem that's just come before it or mm. the poems before it. But also the way that the collection speaks to itself as well, mm -hmm. and I'm just really interested in the way and how much choice you had in terms of editing and putting it. Yes, together like are you thinking of putting a collection together? Also? Pamphlet, You've already yes. got an out. Yes, no, yes. Out. no you're going out. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's wonderful to hear. <laughs> and and so Jeremy Pontin is the editor at People Tree, and he's sort of been there mm -hmm. for about I think thirty years now, and. Um, and he's very like he's so drills down on the detail of each poem. So you send him a manuscript, and it's you know he does not never will say beautiful. You know, oh, I made my heart sing. He'll be like he'll be like hmm cliche. Or you know, he's really harsh. <laughs> Some poems just put a big cross through and say out, <laughs> like get it out. So having that, uh, as I, um, I had um. I had a mentor called Jacob, uh, he's called Jacob Ross, some of you may, have, he's written, he's a, a really wonderful writer, black British writer, Jacob Ross, has written a book called The Bone Readers, 
um, which is a, a Caribbean crime fiction. The Bone Reader is really good. It's like proper page turner. So Jacob, uh, it's a, The Bone Readers by Jacob Ross. It's a part of a trilogy. Really excellent book. So he was my mentor. And he's a little bit like, you know, Jeremy. So um, I got used to, to having that kind of criticism. And I trust them completely. And they're so supportive. And they saw, you know, what I was trying to do and supported me all the way through it. And, and Jeremy just has a, a really keen eye. So I did listen to them both in terms of, you know, what they thought should stay and what should go. But at the same time, there were some places where, like, I pushed back and I was thinking, no, this is the way I want to tell this. This is the way I want to do the story. In terms of the ordering, that was mine. And I always had these ideas of these different sections, you know, the the one dedicated to my mum, mother, son, moon pulled, water rights and fell and a kind of movement through those. And I wanted it to be a kind of movement through the coming to, well, not come, you don't come to terms with the death of somebody, but de you know, dealing with that and then that a kind of movement mm -hmm. through to the spaces that made me feel whole, like uh, for the fell and, and the water rights. Um, but also thinking about the, the way that women kind of thread their way through the narratives as well, um, as well as nature. So I had that structure in mind. And then I think, uh, and so Jeremy actually didn't really mess with the, did not mess, didn't advise mm. on the structure, but he, um, but he did, um, he did, you know, help me or decide which poems should stay and also to editing down. I think that is the key thing, you know, for everybody who's a, uh, doing creative writing is just to be able to be really quite harsh with yourself with yourself and, and think what you know what there's too many words here like where do, what do I cut out how do I make the feeling more succinct how do I I remember uh uh so Jacob Ross he does these these writing classes and um creative writing classes and he said uh in terms of storytelling like the best way the best stories, this is Jacob's theory, is that um, you have a character and you put that character up a tree and you burn the tree down. And what we're interested in as readers is how that character responds to their tree being burnt down. So he makes people do a, uh, one of the Maslow's, um, the hierarchy of oh, yeah. needs, yeah. yeah? This is maybe something Maslow, a lot of, yeah. yeah, people do. But... You know, we have our hierarchy of needs. We we need our basic, you know, food and um, and and water and shelter, safety. But then there's love and um, relationships and family. So he says, take take some of those things away from your character, and see how they respond because it's in their response to this situation, this urgent situation. That that's where your story lies. That's where that's your hook. Like no one's interested in somebody who has like a really nice life and a really nice partner and great kids and goes caravanning on the weekend. I, it's, it's, not, it's not the story we, that we want to hear. We want to know like, how do you deal with these adverse situations? And actually when I found out about my daughter um, and her diagnosis, I was in Bali. Uh, I was actually on Komodo Island where, where they have all these Komodo dragons hiking. And I got this call. And I thought, they said, you know, my daughter's been diagnosed with leukemia, you need to come back. So I had to do a big trek through the forest, about two hour trek, I know Komodo dragons there. Then I had to take a boat to a small island and then hustle my way onto a plane into Dempest to Bali and then Bali to uh, Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia to London, you know, knowing this had happened and just really saying to people in the airlines, you will let me on that plane, like right now. Um, and they did, because nobody gets in the way of a mother when she's going home to a sick child. But I did think, this is happening to me. My tree's being burnt down. I thought of Jacob Ross. It's like, this is, what's important is how you respond. So what's the story? You know, what's, what's my story going to be? There's lots of things I can't control. But what what can I control and what what kind of narrative can I thread through that? Um, so yeah, as a proper literature person, you always see your life in poems or, or in writing. But um, but yeah, so I like that though because a lot of your poems end with text, 
taking control. Like, yes, yeah. I, I felt like that was a theme coming through poems about taking control, and even when you start to lose it in places, you take it back. Yes, I really like that. yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I think that's a very powerful moment on which to <laughs> end, as we do have to vacate the room, sadly, although I think we could listen to you for the rest of the week. Um, but thank you so much again. Thank you, Jenny. Your poetry yeah. and your life with thank us. you. <laughs> thank you. And, you know, thank you all for listening and uh, for your wonderful questions. It's been yeah, a real pleasure to be with you. And good luck with your work, you know, with the course and the study, you know, you know what wonderful hands you're in. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.